iSpace reaches the moon. Relativity Space's 3D printed rocket fails to reach orbit. A mission will search for habitable worlds at Alpha Centauri. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. There are a few very scary milestones that you have to be concerned about when you're launching a mission to space and to some other place. There's just like getting your rocket off the ground, getting through the densest parts of the atmosphere at your highest speeds, separating the different stages from your rocket. And when you finally make it into space and you get to your destination, going into an insertion orbit around the target. Of course, also landing is scary too, but um, we got a pretty great announcement this week that iSpace completed that insertion orbit milestone by arriving at the moon. And this is a private company that was able to fly from Earth on a Falcon 9 rocket and then use its own system to raise its orbit to be able to go into orbit around the moon. So the iSpace Hakuto R spacecraft is carrying two payloads that it's going to take down to the surface of the moon. It has the United Arab Emirates rover called Rashid, and it has a Japanese transformable robot called Sora Q. And the plan is that it's going to carry both of these payloads down to the surface in the next couple of months and deploy them. And if this works, then we will have a private company that is capable of taking your payload and depositing it down on the surface of the moon. And recently we've seen that this is actually really hard and really scary thing to do. We had India's Chandrayaan-2 lander, which failed to reach the surface of the moon. We had the Israelis' bare sheet lander, which failed to reach the surface of the moon. And there are other missions that have failed at this challenge in the past. And so if you've got this company that specializes just in taking payloads from Earth to the surface of the moon, that's going to be fantastic. And there's going to be a lot of future missions, landers, experiments, rovers that are heading off to the moon to prepare the way for humans to return to the moon. So congratulations to iSpace so far. Now comes the tricky part and actually getting down to the surface. Relativity's 3D printed rocket gets to space, sort of. So speaking of those milestones that I mentioned, right, you've got take your rocket taking off, you've got reaching max Q, you've you're separating your upper stage from your lower stage. Those are all tricky milestones to reach. And this week, we saw what happens when you don't hit all of those milestones. Now, this is a mission that I've been keeping my eye on for quite a while. And I'm I've been pretty excited about it. It's from Relativity Space. Relativity Space is a new space rocket company. And I'm pretty excited about what they're working on for a couple of really big reasons. So their new rocket is called the Terran One. And what sets it apart is one, 85% of the components were 3D printed, which is great because you can imagine future rockets having most of the parts 3D printed assembled relatively easy compared to all of the complex machining that goes on to build a rocket. And then the second part is that they use methane similar to what's going to happen with Starship with New Glenn and other potential rocket systems like the Vulcan. And so with this 3D printed methane rocket, they did a test this week to see if they could get to space. They did, but they didn't go into orbit. So the rocket took off, no problem. The first stage fired fine. They reached max Q, the point of sort of the highest dynamic pressure on the rocket. They detached the first and second stage, but the second stage failed to ignite. And so they reached a final altitude of about 129 kilometers, which is technically in space but they weren't able to actually go into orbit. But still, this is a pretty dramatic test of a new way of building a rocket using a new fuel system. I mean, we know that Starship is going to be using methane. We know that Vulcan will be using methane, but we haven't seen a proper launch to space with this fuel system yet recently. And so congratulations to Relativity Space for winning the methane to space race. Now, I think one of my favorite parts about this is the photo that they shared of the rocket just as it was taking off. And like, look at the color of the launch plume. This is from the methane fuel and how it interacts with itself and the atmosphere as the rocket is taking off. 
It's so beautiful. Relativity is working on a larger version of the rocket called the Terran R and hopefully with these 3D printed parts, with this fuel system, they're going to be able to compete for the launch market against other companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin. We got more science from DART. Now, if you remember last week, I told you about how scientists were studying the environment around asteroid Dimorphos and Didymus as the DART mission was coming in, all of the little pebbles that had been sent into orbit from the rapid rotation of the asteroid. We got even more observations this week thanks to the European Southern Observatory's very large telescope, which is one of the biggest telescope facilities on Earth, which made a bunch of follow on observations after the impact. What makes the VLT really special is it has a polarization instrument on board that allows it to measure the polarization of the light coming from the objects that it's imaging. And so with its observations of Dimorphos, astronomers were able to see that pristine material on the surface of the asteroid was blown off into space. They also did a bunch of follow on observations to see if they could even just detect the propellant from the DART mission in the expanding cloud of debris, and they didn't. And one of the things that was really interesting was they were able to see the color of the debris field change over time. Initially, it started off redder as you had a lot of larger objects, and then it slowly turned bluer as you had smaller and smaller particles. So like, think about how smoke looks kind of blue. And that's because you've got very small particles that are suspended in the atmosphere. It's a similar process when you're looking at the composition of a debris cloud. So the most powerful telescope on Earth did these follow on observations to see what happened with the DART impact and a lot more information was learned. Looking for habitable planets at Alpha Centauri. Now this is a trope in science fiction where the first tentative steps that humanity makes out into the universe is to go to Alpha Centauri. And good news, there's habitable Earth like worlds at Alpha Centauri that we're able to use as a stepping stone out into the cosmos. But that's just science fiction. We don't actually know if there are any planets at all at Alpha Centauri. We know there are planets at Proxima Centauri, but not at the twin stars of Alpha Centauri. And so a new space telescope is going to try and answer this exact question. It's called Ptolemon. And actually Ptolemon is one of the names of one of the stars in the binary pair of stars that make up Alpha Centauri. And so if all goes well, this telescope is going to launch in 2024. And it's really small. It's just a CubeSat that is mostly a telescope jammed into a CubeSat package. And it's going to use a really clever trick. When astronomers are trying to detect planets orbiting stars using the astrometry method, and this is what Gaia does, they have to have this really pristine view of a star field that they use as a reference. And then they're watching any individual star to see what kind of movements it makes back and forth. And so with a really small telescope, they can't observe this, these background stars with that level of precision. But good news, because Alpha Centauri is a binary system, and both stars are extremely bright, what Ptolemy will do is look at the two stars at the same time and focus on one of the stars as a reference and then watch if the other star is wobbling just a little bit in its field of view. And then it'll do the other way around and look at the other star and watch and see if the one star is wobbling around. And so in theory, it should be able to detect if there are planets orbiting either one of these stars. And the kinds of changes that a planet makes to its star are quite minimal. When you think about the Earth orbiting around the sun, the Earth's gravity pulls the sun just a couple of hundred meters off of a center point. And that is a small enough wobble that Ptolemy should be able to detect it. Now I know a lot of information about this because I just did an interview with the principal researcher for this mission. And we're going to be posting that interview in the next couple of days, you'll be able to find out a lot more information about the mission. But by 2024, within a couple of years, 2026, we could know if there are habitable worlds at Alpha Centauri, thanks to Ptolemy. It's another week, it's another time for me to hail the Gaia mission, which has just delivered so much science to astronomers so far. And just each week, I find these amazing research papers done with Gaia. And so this week, I found a paper where astronomers reported that they found 1,179 previously unknown 
open star clusters in our corner of the Milky Way, which like <laughs> mic drop. <laughs> Humble brag, it's amazing. Now open star clusters, these are the kinds of star clusters that you get after a stellar nebula has formed, after all of the big stars have detonated a supernova, after all of the stars have blown away the surrounding nebula material with their intense radiation pressure. And you're just left with these young stars floating together through the Milky Way. And then over time, their interactions with other stars, other clusters start to peel away the stars one by one until you can no longer figure out when they formed where they formed together. We know that the sun must have formed in some kind of star cluster like some of them that we see out there. But yet we can't find the other stars that we formed with. I mean, astronomers think they know of like one or two that might have been our siblings, but not the other hundreds, maybe even 1000s. They're scattered randomly across the Milky Way. And so by finding these open star clusters, astronomers will learn a tremendous amount just about the evolution of the Milky Way and about how star clusters form and then they slowly lose their stars over time. And to be able to look at over 1000 new star clusters is really impressive. So thanks Gaia, again. As you know, this is our NIAC month where I am interviewing one person every week who received a NIAC award from NASA, all of the crazy out of the box, innovative advanced concepts. We've posted a couple of interviews already and there's still many more in the can to come. So we're going to produce one of these every Thursday, all through this month into April. So hopefully you'll enjoy and of course, this is one of the things that we can do thanks to our Patreon members. And if you want to support the work that we do help us be an independent space reporting organization, go to patreon.com slash universe today. And speaking of interviews, I mean, we've been releasing many interviews in the last couple of weeks, months, and there's many more coming just to give you some examples, I'm going to be talking to the chief engineer for the UAE's hope mission in a couple of days. I've got this interview about the Ptolemy mission, so we can learn about finding exoplanets at Alpha Centauri, and many more. So if you just watch space bites, and you want more information, you want to go deeper, I highly recommend you check out the interviews. Moons orbiting rogue planets could be habitable. Astronomers suspect that there are billions of rogue planets floating freely across the Milky Way. And these are planets that just don't have a star. Now, maybe they just formed in place out of a small amount of stellar material, or maybe they were kicked out of a newly forming star system. Because these planets don't have a star, you think they would be completely cold and inhospitable, no place for life. But according to a new paper, that's not true, there could be life there, not on the planets themselves, but on their moons. And so think about the solar system, we've got Jupiter, and it's got its Galilean moons, Io, the one that's closest is the most volcanically active place in the solar system. And that has nothing to do with the sun and everything to do with the tidal interactions, the gravity of Jupiter and the various moons as they interact with each other. And so you can imagine a similar situation where you've got a Jupiter like gas giant floating freely across the Milky Way. However, it got ejected from its planetary system, it took its moons with it. And now those moons are tidally interacting with each other. And you could have a situation where one of those moons is covered with liquid water, not just like Europa, where the water is under a thick sheet of ice. But if it's at exactly the right distance, it's not lava, it's liquid water. And that's really exciting. You know, I, I sort of imagine some kind of science fiction future where we've got some space mission that's going off to some nearby star system and they stop at a rogue planet and it's liquid covered moons for a spa in the volcanic waters before and to resupply their their propellant and supplies, and maybe even find life there while they they're hanging around at the moon. It's pretty cool. And there could be life because you've got these tidal interactions between the planet and the moon, you're going to have tides where the water goes up on the seashore and then goes back. And astrobiologists think that the tidal interaction between the moon and the Earth was one of the reasons why life might have formed on Earth and spread as well as it did that you've got this tidal layer where you've got life that's trying to survive in the intertidal zone and the water's going 
up and down. And that is helping to teach these life forms to evolve to be able to live in this kind of an environment. So you've kind of got all the raw materials that you need, you don't have sunlight. But we know thanks to the black smokers that are down at the bottom of the ocean, that you can have life without access to sunlight. And so you could have these worlds with these moons that have liquid water on their surface, and potentially even life. The one thing to note, though, is that the tidal interactions do slow down over time, everything will eventually balance out to the point that the moons are in lockstep around the planet, and the tidal heating will come to an end. But that'll take billions of years. And so you could still have plenty of time for life to form. Ingenuity sees a Mars sunset. One final picture for you to look at. This is a sunset on Mars seen by NASA's Ingenuity helicopter. And this was taken during its 45th flight, taken a few more flights after that really nearing the 50th flight on Mars, like I want to just like stop and think about the fact that a helicopter on Mars has almost flown 50 times each time going several meters into the air, flying for almost a kilometer to explore and check out new places like this is the way future missions to Mars are going to work where you're going to have a helicopter flying sidekick with a rover or astronauts are going to be deploying these little helicopters to help them look around on the environment wherever they're exploring. It's, it's pretty crazy. You know, they only expected it to fly just a handful of times and here we are closing in on 50. So we got this sunset from Mars. And what I like about this is that because the atmosphere on Mars is so thin, it's almost like space, then you're seeing the sun almost pure white, which is very similar to how it looks if you are out in space. Here on Earth, we've got our atmosphere and that changes the color of a sunset, you'll see something that is yellow, maybe even red, if you've got smoke in the atmosphere. But here we get this very space like sunset seen from the surface of Mars gives me chills. All right, those are all the news stories that we had today. Now, if you want more information, check out the links in the show notes down below. You can get even more space news in my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 60,000 people. I write every word, there are no ads, and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash podcast, or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent and keeps the ads at a bare minimum. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Jay Dennis, David Gilton, and Maud so, George, Jeremy Mattern, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Verbioff, Andrew M. Gross, and Josh Schultz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us. All right, that was all the news that we had today. We'll see you next week.